Okay, I would like to call this meeting to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mrs. Becker? Here. Mr. Cummings? Here. Ms. Gloss? Mrs. Herrick? Here. Mr. Hong? Here. Mrs. Reese? Here. President Lax? Here. We have a quorum. Please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the rights of the public to have advance notice of and to attend meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed and acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the East Brunswick Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof posted at the Board of Education offices. Written notice was also provided to the Sentinel, the New York Star Ledger, the Home News Tribune, the Alternate Press of East Brunswick, and the Municipal Clerk of East Brunswick. All Board of Education meetings, with the exception of executive session discussions, are also videotaped for later broadcast. It is a policy of the Board of Education that videotaped meetings are not edited for any purpose. Individuals who speak at the Board's public meeting should be aware of these videotaping rules. Good evening to my Darhad fans. Um, I apologize, but as advertised, we're going to go right into executive session, whereas the Board of Education must discuss matters which are not appropriate for discussion in a public meeting, and these subjects are within the exception to the Open Public Meetings Act and are permitted to be discussed in closed session. The Board of Education intends to discuss matters as follows, those items listed on tonight's agenda. The length of closed session is estimated to be one hour, after which the public meeting of the board shall reconvene and action will be taken. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the East Brunswick Board of Education will recess into closed session for only the aforesaid subjects, and be it further resolved that the East Brunswick Board of Education hereby declares that its discussion of the aforesaid subjects will be made public at a time when the public's interest in disclosure is greater than any privacy or governmental interest being protected from disclosure in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Mm -hmm. Moved by Mrs. Becker and second by Mr. Cummings. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. And we shall return in an hour. Okay, welcome back. Dr. Valeski, would you like to start us off with the superintendent's report? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. The artwork on display in the boardroom this evening was created by students from Hammershold <coughs> Upper Elementary School. The art teachers of these talented students are Miriam Sultan and Catherine Barrett. Russ Petronco is the principal. And there's also some artwork on the table over there by our, our SSO bill. On Thursday, March 21st, Board President Lori Lax and I visited the East Brunswick Municipal Center to observe students in John Pulaski's IPL 1 honors course where they presented ideas for redeveloping a community. As part of the urban plan project, students learn fundamental forces that affect development in our communities. This intense stimula uh, simulation allows students to experience challenging issues, work with interest of private and public sectors, navigate complex trade-offs and understand economics while proposing realistic land use solutions to vexing growth problems. Each group made its pitch to Mayor Cohen and a team of experts and responded to questions about their decisions. This was a great experience that showcased our students' ability to make intelligent decisions and think on their feet. And we'll have the winners come and present again? Yes. Things have been shaking at East Brunswick Public Schools. Uh, kindergarten students at Lawrence Brook Elementary School found a way to celebrate the earthquake, as only <laughs> students can do. Aww. Aww. Each student made a special hat that read, I rocked my first earthquake. Good for them. And lights out in East Brunswick. On Monday, April 8th, students were able to enjoy a somewhat clear uh, skyscape to view the eclipse. And we are grateful to the East Brunswick Education Foundation for supplying Eclipse classes. By the way, they were all certified Eclipse classes to all students. It was a team effort to ensure our students could enjoy the Eclipse in a safe manner. In the morning, we had Eclipse ambassadors. Students from Churchill High School visited 
each elementary school along with Hammershold to give brief presentations on the eclipse and how to view it safely. My paper's stuck there. We thank the high school physics teacher, Stephanie Holtzman, for organizing the students and helping them to develop their presentations. And it was great to see older students have an opportunity to interact and teach the younger students. Churchill in the high school got an early glimpse of the eclipse while Hammershaw was able to be out on the field during peak coverage time. Elementary students were also able to see substantial coverage before beginning their <coughs> dismissal. The students appeared enthusiastic throughout the viewing experience, and when the clouds cleared, you could hear their excitement as they watched the eclipse unfold. The Early Learning Academy preschool students were very excited to be part of the 2024 eclipse. Students celebrated together with various crafts and lessons. Are those Oreos and in And so if stages? you look at the picture, those are Oreos <laughs> in different phases of the eclipse. Around That's the, the way paper to teach plate. eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> So That's informative great. and edible. That's great for them. In reading news, Central <laughs> Elementary School challenged students to score the greatest number of minutes in a reading challenge. The class that read the most as a whole won and earned the chance to play basketball against their teachers. The Rutgers mascot and Lady Knights basketball players were special guests that surprised the students during the game. Diara Agarwal, a third grader at Lawrencebrook Elementary School, was awarded third place in the countywide bookmark contest held by Keep Middlesex Moving. Her original drawing was put on bookmarks that were distributed to all students at Lawrencebrook, as well as libraries and other organizations throughout Middlesex County. So congratulations to her. For the seventh time, East Brunswick Public Schools has been named Best Communities for Music Education by National Association of Music Merchants. Being designated as a NAM, Best Communities for Music Education, is a rigorous process where the Music Research Institute at the University of Kansas reviews and verifies information about the district's funding, graduation requirements, class music participation, instruction time, facilities, support for the music program, and community music making programs. In sports, East Brunswick girls swimming won the Central Group A sectional state championship at TCNJ for the first time in school history. So congratulations wow. to them. And finally, third quarter report cards can be viewed online through parent access on Monday, April 15th. Hard copies will be made available at the request of anyone without internet access. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valeski. All right, Mr. Giuliani, you ready yes. for the budget update? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we're continuing uh, discussions, presentation uh, with regard to the 2024-25 school district budget. At the last board meeting, the board uh, adopted the tentative budget. And one of the things that I remind uh, everyone is that the budget was a tentative budget. Uh, it is subject to change, and there will be changes in the budget as we move forward. Um, I wanted to start out this evening with uh, just going over uh, what our process is and what the process has been for this, uh, for this particular budget. This process began in November. Uh, that's when the uh, green light pretty much goes off, administrators start to develop their budgets, um, and then they have a period of time within which to submit their budgets, their base budgets, their budget requests, and that's followed by formal budget manager meetings which are held uh, administratively, and that involves the assistant superintendents, the superintendent, and each individual budget manager. Uh, within that period of time, there are 35 meetings that take place <coughs> with all of the budget managers. Following that process, we begin the compilation analysis and discussion internally. That goes on January through March, and a lot of that also happens concurrently with the finance committee meetings. 
Finance Committee meetings were held the end of January, throughout February, and then by February 29th is when the state aid uh, data was released by the Department of Education. Following that information, additional Finance Committee meetings were held in March, and then a tentative budget adoption. What's really important in this time frame is that regardless of the amount of time that planning, discussions, um, prioritization occurs, that the time from the date that the state aid data is released to the adoption of the tentative budget is less than three weeks. That's not a bad thing when you can count on your revenue being in the positive. It's not such a great thing when there's a surprise regarding a reduction in revenue. One of the things I also want to note during this period of time, and I think even if we go back to last year's budget process, one of the things that I advise the board at finance committee level and at board meetings was that we were going to have what I believe to be a difficult process coming up. So let's go into budget facts. I believe at the last meeting, one of the things I noted was um, that the district was facing um, an approximately $8 million budget gap between appropriations and revenue. So I want to talk about that for a moment. Um, and one of the things that I, I believe I also noted, but I, I, it bears repeating, is that it will certainly impact staff. It will impact staff across all areas, but one of the things that's important is that no programs will be decimated. I think there's a concern about that. Um, it is being done in a thoughtful manner. And just for the record, we can't go through the details of what those are because the courtesy needs to be provided to the staff. The affected staff need to be advised first. And those details will be forthcoming at the next meeting. But in the meantime, we have to respect that staff need to hear this internally from their administrators so that there are no surprises and they're not learning it from a presentation. So let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the impacts. So first, and this is one of the slides that was presented previously, uh, health benefits. We're seeing increases in health benefits across the board. We're looking at 7% um, in our increase in our rates in each of the health benefit areas. I'll talk about what that means in terms of a real dollar amount as we move forward. Charter school increase, $740,000 increase in charter schools. Uh, this is attributable to uh, the Hatikva having been approved by the Department of Education to uh, increase uh, its sections, uh, its number of students that it can accommodate. So uh, as that occurs, any changes in enrollment in the Hatikva charter schools results in money coming out of the school district budget. It is, the school district budget is the source of funding for the Hatikva charter school. And as a result, as the funding increases to the charter school, it continues to remove resources uh, from the school district. Now, while $740,000 may not seem like, you know, it's a lot, but it's not $8 million, I think one of the important points in this really comes down to what I've said over the years when it comes to the charter school. East Brunswick has not needed a charter school and should not have a charter school. It has taken, through next year, $5.8 million out of the school district budget when the school district and the East Brunswick Public Schools can provide the necessary and actually superior educational product than the charter school. So let's look at revenue and expenditure impacts. 
So I'll start out by saying, you know, this is similar to a um, listing that is done each year to identify what are the impacts affecting the budget. Uh, last year, I believe the total impact was uh, five, uh, about $9.4 million in total. Let's talk about each of the components here. And this year, I've added the revenue side because I think this bears um, uh, important note. We used six point five, identified $6.5 million in a state aid shortfall. And we'll talk a little bit further about that later. But as we've seen state aid over the last several years, state aid has been increasing because the state was moving toward bringing the district to where it should have been in terms of total state aid. The district had been held back, first capped for a period of time, relatively flat, and then started to see some increases, very small at first, and the last couple of years, more substantial increases. And that was supposed to take place over a period of three or four years. Two years ago, the state aid increase was $7.4 million. Last year, it was $6.5 million. We were again, as I said, anticipating a sizable increase for next year. And yet we had a state aid reduction of nearly, of over $1.3 million. Those two components on their own are nearly $8 million in revenue. Let's look at the expenditure side. We have to take into consideration that state aid reduction. That counts on two columns, not only in terms of total revenue, but what, what's an adverse impact on the other side of the ledger. So 1.3 million in state aid. We talked about the charter school increase, 740,000. Special education out of district tuition. This is an area that has substantially affected the district, not because of the special education services, but because of the tuition rate increases that have been approved to go on by the Department of Education. If we look at the number of students that are in out-of-district placements, what was budgeted for the fiscal 2024 year and budgeted for the fiscal 2025 year, the variance is only two additional students. And we've had students come and go, but that variance is still two. I think the total number of students projected for next year, I'm sorry, not projected, these are actual students, 56 students, 56 students, two additional students from the current year does not coincide with a $1.2 million increase in, in special education tuition. But that is the reality of what we're dealing with. Special education tuition is based on the tuition rates that are provided to school districts by those respective special schools. It is not a made up number. Next, contractual salary increases. We have collective bargaining agreements uh, with two associations, and we have non-unit staff. And based on those collective bargaining agreements and the movement of the existing staff, now this is based on the staff snapshot that we took in November to project our salaries, but that contractual increase is almost $3.9 million. Health benefits, I talked about that briefly on the previous slide. Health benefit increase of 7%, but that's not the end of the story. Last year, in order to close the budget, the board approved a one-time adjustment to bring the health benefit budget down by about $1.1 million. It was essentially saying, we will anticipate that we will not incur the level of claims that might otherwise come in. 
It was a calculated risk. But that $1.1 million does not hold perpetually. So that's a component that impacts uh, the budget. So health benefit increase of almost $3.3 million. During the last year, so current year and, and even in last year, after the budget was struck for fiscal 2024, you can look on board meeting agendas, there have been numerous positions that have had to be approved for compliance, compliance with special ed law, compliance with individual education plans, and the total of those non-budgeted positions is almost $1.4 million. That could not be anticipated. Therapeutic counseling services. We've been fortunate the last several years, in a manner of speaking, because it was the result of COVID, which certainly was not a fortunate event. But because of the federal government's funding, we have had resources from the federal government to provide therapeutic counseling services. And we've been able to increase the level of those services over the last couple of years. Well, the COVID funds don't exist anymore. And so in order for those services to continue into the next year, there's an additional $572,000 that had to be added into the budget. Transportation. Transportation contracts, when we look at the actual transportation base for contracts awarded this year and look at that, the increase for next year, that's a 3% increase. 3% when the Department of Education has issued, with the state aid notices, by the way, saying that the CPI for transportation contracts was nearly 6%. That's a non-starter for us. We can't do that. We're trying not to do renewals at 3%. We're negotiating with companies to keep that cost down and maybe not even at that $300,000. But the reality is that when it comes to transportation services, it is an obligation that the district has. We don't, trans we don't provide courtesy transportation. We provide transportation for students that are entitled to transportation pursuant to the law and IEPs. And then the last item on this list is custodial. This is our custodial contract. We have a renewal coming up that uh, the board, um, I believe it's on this evening's agenda, but the differential in cost is an additional $245,000. So when you come to the total of all of these impacts on the expenditure side, it's so nearly $13 million. So now let's talk about that state aid reduction and drill into that a little bit. State aid reduction of $1.3 million. And I, I will say, and I, I believe I've said this many times in the past, when it comes to state aid and the state aid formula, it is an extremely complicated bear to try to wrap your arms around. It is complex. There are many variables in the state aid formula. And, but I do want to get into a couple of the variables that seem to have had a direct impact on our state aid for next year. So this chart provides, at this point, an analysis or a, a recapitulation of equalized valuations. Now, equalized valuations are what are the value of properties in town? And the state looks at those values, and because, for example, East Brunswick is not valued at 100% of 
true value, the state takes a look at those values and adjusts to bring them up to a 100% valuation. The same holds true with every other town in this state. Towns may be uh, valued at 90%, um, 95%, anywhere in that range. East Brunswick is roughly at about 20% of true value. The reason for equalized values and making that conversion is to level the playing field so that all municipalities are being looked at with the same lens. What we can see here is that equalized values have gone up. So when we look at from 2021 to 2022 fiscal year, the increase wasn't that much. It's about $48 million. From 22 to 23, the increase was almost 563 or 564 million dollars. From the fiscal 23 to the fiscal 24 year, the increase was 409 million dollars. Looking ahead to the st most recent state aid calculations, the increase in equalized value for East Brunswick was 798 million dollars. I'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. So now let's add another component, district income. District income looks at the income tax filings with the Department of Treasury for the state of New Jersey from two, fiscal, two calendar years prior to the current year. So it's essentially looking at data from 2022. District income, so the income of households, has increased. Well, first of all, the first year from going from 2021 to 2022 fiscal, it went down by $1.6 million. Subsequently, going to the fiscal 23 fiscal year, it went up $252.6 million. Then there was a small increase from 23 to 24 of $9.3 million. So as I'm going through these numbers, I'm working my way from bottom up. But then from 24 to fiscal 2025, the income increased $360.7 million. This information is all relevant to state aid and the state aids formula. I want to go through a couple more pieces of information. So in the state aid calculations, one of the items that is reflected is uncapped state aid. So when you see uncapped, well, the other side of that must be, well, there must be a cap also on state aid. But this is what we should have gotten. So in 2021, 2022, 2023, and so forth, you see the incremental um, increases through 2024. 2025, there's a big decrease in the uncapped state aid. So now let's look at the calculated state aid. This is the actual state aid received in each of these years. So you can see, starting from the bottom up, that the calculated state aid in fiscal 21 was substantially less than what it should have been. And so as time went on, the state I mentioned earlier was doing some catch up to bring us to a point where we should be fully funded. But in each one of these instances, we were never at capped state aid. Well, part of this has to do with the um, fact that the state aid formula was not 
really being fully implemented. I talked earlier about the equalized valuations and district income. And when we look at the years prior to 24-25, it seems that equalized values and district income don't necessarily have any correlation to state aid. Increases were taking place, state aid was going up until 2025. The increases in equalized value were substantial, almost $800 million. The increase in income for the district, almost $361 million. And our state aid is then reduced. Well, that's a big thank you for having a town where property values have gone up, where the town folk are doing well. And what does the state formula say? The state formula says, you know, East Brunswick, you don't need so much state aid. You support it. And I think as a side note, the legislature, um, in recognizing some of the impacts that it's had on districts like East Brunswick, because we're not alone in terms of our reduction, Yes, there are districts that have gotten very large increases, $10 million and more. But there are districts that are in the process of making tough decisions as well, just like East Brunswick. But the legislature, in recognizing that difficulty, introduced a bill. I don't recall what the bill number is, but there was a bill that said, well, for those districts um, that have seen cuts in state aid, and I don't know what the status of the bill is, but for those districts that have seen cuts in state aid, you can raise your tax beyond the level that is in the state uh, formula for raising taxes. You can go to 9.9%. Well, I don't think I need to say anything in this room or to those that would be watching this, there is no way, absolutely no way, that this board or this town could sustain a 9.9% increase. That's ridiculous. Our goal is to try and keep the tax levy down at a reasonable level within the caps, if that's at all possible. So, <coughs> Notwithstanding the status of that bill, we need to make decisions that keep us within the spending program that's available. Excuse me a moment. Bernie, just to note that bill is Assembly Bill 4161. Thank you, Dr. Valeski. So, I said there are tough decisions being made out of respect for the staff that are impacted. We're not going over those details tonight. But I want to go over a few other points. Let's talk about class sizes, because I know this is a particular uh, area of interest um, at the elementary level. So class sizes. For next year, our average class sizes are as presented on this chart. Kindergarten at 16 students, grade one at 16 students, grade two at 18, grade three at 17, and grade four at 18. So notwithstanding the decisions that are being made and that will need to be implemented, we're maintaining class sizes at very reasonable levels, K to four. So now, 
Let's go into the general fund budget a little bit. Uh, <coughs> this is a summary. Uh, this is not the same number that was presented on the tentative adoption because we've been making some internal revisions. And certainly the summary of revisions will be discussed uh, once they're finalized, that'll be discussed at the public hearing. But at this point, we are at uh, 197, uh, almost $197.3 million. Uh, the budget's currently in balance. And this is where we fall with regard to tax levy. The tax levy increase is a bit less than it was reported at the tentative budget uh, adoption. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, the tax levy increase was, for the general fund, was 4.15 percent. We've been able to bring that down a bit to 3.97. Not where we'd like it to be, but one of the things that's important to note, and I shared this with uh, the board and the finance committee, is that for every half of a percent reduction in that increase, would require about $740,000 in additional cuts. You can't do that on pencils and paper. That's people. And I think we're about as far as we're ready to go at this point. The debt service fund tax levy will go down next year, almost $300,000. The debt service fund, that's our mortgage payment. So that fluctuates a bit from one year to the next, but that will go down next year by 6%. So the net composite increase at this point in time is 3.63%. Our public hearing is April 25th. And the final adoption on the budget is May 9th. Thank you, Mr. Giuliana. I don't envy you this task. Um, I do also always like to remind people, you see one side of things when um, Mr. Giuliana presents the budget to the board. But as he mentioned, all the months and months of work that goes into it and meetings where board members ask questions. So please don't ever mistake sometimes when you hear less questions being asked that they aren't being asked. Um, I assure you they are. And actually, I'm going to put you on the spot, Mrs. Becker, as our finance chair. <laughs> um, because sometimes I think because we are asking questions and getting the answers, um, and the public doesn't see it, I think it may be helpful for some of the big questions that we've asked as a board. If maybe um, I could put you on the spot and Thank you. have you. Uh, you're not putting me on the spot because um, so. board members have been asking me questions. I've had some of my own, and there were also things that I think are worth, even if they've been answered, are, asked, are worth asked to repeat because some of the processes, particularly illustrated by the presentation we just saw, which is a very good presentation, thank you, but a bit overwhelming, needs to be kind of, certain pieces need to be extrapolated and explained further. So um, in no particular order, these are questions from me, other board members, and things that I think need to be brought out and questioned. I want to start with, uh, again, no particular order, Bernie, sorry. I want to start with the um, COVID grant funds that are no longer available. Um, when we received these funding, which, um, transfer, which seemed to be used for special education staff and mental health services costs, were the staff and administrators at the time fully explained that these funds were going to have a limited shelf life that they would not go on <coughs> forever was was this explained to yes. the staff so absolutely I believe that was even done um, at board meeting or two um, but absolutely uh, for any staff that were uh, newly funded uh, through the COVID grants and there were a number of COVID grants that came in um, we looked at 
what we were going to be able to support through those grants, how long that would be sustained, and provided a timeline through which those positions would need to be transitioned out because it was very clear. We could not sustain those positions beyond the term of that grant funding. They were necessary, but there needed to be steps to be able to wean off of those positions. Okay, follow-up question to that. Um, going back to the budget development page where you started talking about starting the budget discussions in November and the formal budget manager meetings in December and 35 separate ones, was part of this discussion um, the elimination or these funds no longer being available and uh, discussion about how to handle being uh, absorbed by their budget manager report for this coming, this, this budget that we're adopting? Was there guidance provided? Um, discussion of, of programs that could be implemented different ways or staff that could be used different ways? It just wasn't going to stop the funding. It, there was going to be some kind, had to be some kind of transition, and I want to know um, how much discussion there was with the staff uh, affected and how much guidance was provided. Oh, we had conversations. They didn't just happen during budget meetings. They happened throughout just, no. you know, as, as time Correct, went on. Correct, but I'm just referring, yeah. Yeah, those conversations absolutely took place. Um, you know, was it up to those department areas to really address that because that's beyond the role of what we can do from our end. So, um, you know, without getting into the weeds and calling out specific areas, I don't want to do that. Uh, but, yeah, those were very specific conversations that had been had. And, Specker, the if I could just insert, the 35 budget meetings that Mr. Julian referenced in his presentation, those were opportunities for those budget managers to have conversations, and it was clearly identified things that were in their budget that were going to expire, what they had to do differently, if they hadn't already taken care of it. So, but many, many managers came in anticipating that those, those funds weren't going to be there. So, um, the budget manager reports that ended up being reported to the Finance Committee and then to the full board reflected a series of conversations that you and Dr. Valeski and your staffs had with the individual budget managers to help them figure out how to make this all work? I'm sorry, I didn't follow that. Um, the budget manager reports that were finally reported, that were finally given to the Finance Committee and then presented to the board, were the culmination, the result of all these conversations that have been happening since December Oh, yes. on how to handle transitioning the funds from being available to not and what we were doing with those programs and staff. Well, uh, I think one of the things to remember is that the transition, it, the grant funds are not accounted for in the general fund. So the grant monies are not part of this mix. Okay. That was a completely separate, it's required to be accounted for separately. It's accounted for in what's called the special revenue fund. That's where all grants are accounted. Okay. So the two didn't cross over. We didn't have COVID staff within the general fund staff. Okay. They're maintained separately. So as those grant funds expired, so did those positions. Thank you, because I, I, I don't think uh, everyone totally understood that. I think that um, there was not a sense of the special revenue funds. Uh, guys, I have a lot of questions. Um, well, not a lot, I mean, but I have a number of questions, again, from myself and from other board members, but I don't want to monopolize this. So if at any point someone feels like, Vic, you've talked enough, like, could I get in a question, I'll just stop and then return. Okay. Thank you. Um, could you just talk for a minute about when we go back and look at state aid funding? I understand this, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a very important piece for the public to understand and for new board members. Why is flat funding really a decrease 
the state makes a very big deal about years, flat funding, flat funding. But that's actually a decrease. Well, yes, we've talked about this for years, um, for all the years that, that we had flat funding. That bears um, repeating. And, and yes, and, and I'm acknowledging. Um, so, you know, flat funding, when you look at, if your state aid is just for purposes of, of uh, illustrating, is at $20 million, um, and you have $100 million in your appropriations budget, and then the next year your state aid is at $20 million, but your appropriations budget is $110 million, and then the next year your state aid stays at $20 million, but your appropriations budget goes to $120 million, the, the, the ratio, the percentage of funding from the state to support the budget diminishes over time. And so that has a, and that, that's essentially not flat. One would anticipate that if- a decrease. If funding were going to remain flat, that it would at least keep pace with its share of what, of supporting the budget where it had-, had And of accounting for the price, the cost of everything going up. Absolutely. Right, so, okay. <coughs> Staying on the subject of school funding. We all heard the dramatic announcement, as you referred to, um, that uh, the governor announced that this year, um, I'm paraphrasing, the state announced that state aid would be fully funded to school districts. That's, that was the first thing that we heard. Um, and then we, along with, I don't know, I remember reading the number in the newspaper, I don't remember, 100, 150 other districts in the state found out that we were getting a decrease and we also found out that as you referred, referenced, there were districts literally getting $10 million increase, $10 million increases, $15 million increases, $20 million increases, even $5 million increases, even $1 million increases. I know you said it's, it's hard to explain <clears throat> But I was getting a little lost amongst the terminology of the equalized valuation, district income, uncapped state aid. Is, is the state providing the equal value, valuation numbers and the um, district income? Is, is that all, all, the, all those numbers provided by the state, do you yeah. know? Yes, so those are all uh, that's all data that the state uh, captures from its own data warehouses. So it collects that information from uh, the Department of Treasury, New Jersey Department of Treasury, uh, whether it be the equalized values. The Department of Treasury is responsible for um, arriving at what the equalized values are across the entire state. Uh, it's responsible for, in the Division of Taxation, uh, collecting the data regarding income. So all of that is information that the state has and the state pulls from its own resources into the formula. I think one of the things that um, uh, I, I didn't mention before, but I think it's important when it comes to the state aid um, calculation, if you will, is that the state has always, regardless of how the formula has been written, whether it's the current formula, past formulas. Here's how the state works. The state says, you know, we're gonna put X amount of dollars into the pot for state aid. And while we have these variables that go into the calculation, there are some variables, some factors that are used that are inexplicable. There's no definition for what they are. Those seem to be um, where they make the numbers work. So there's a whole complex formula and then there's a little factor of some decimals that are entered and that's how they make it work to come out to what the total pot or to equal what the total pot of money that's available for state aid comes out to be. I won't try to explain it. We've gone through and analyzed the formula um, to the point where we've got all the components 
but it's this unknown piece where it's derived that there's no definition for where it's derived. So uh, I understand that, but um, you said something before which actually kind of provided some clarity and it, it, it reduced it to a, a fairly common goal that based on the increased value of our homes yes and so the increased increased average or aggregate aggregate income for East Brunswick the state put that through their matrix their formula and came up with the fact that we didn't need as much state aid we could afford to pay for this on our own but now, state aid numbers are not private. They were public. They were in all the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So if I say, but the same matrix they used came up with uh, Woodbridge couldn't afford $20 million of their budget. I, I, I honestly... I'm I, not asking you to so explain, but comment. I'm trying to make sense of... Right. So, and, and I can't help you make sense of what happened in Woodbridge or Edison. I can speak to East Brunswick. Okay. No, okay. I know. I'm not asking so, you to. So, but it. what I can tell you is this, that there, in, in the analysis of the state aid formula, that there is a direct correlation of the equalized value and income increases for the town versus the state aid. Vicki, can the I? Wealthier, <coughs> the wealthier, quote-unquote, wealthier, in whatever terms the state is looking at its formula, the community is the less state support. I understand that quote. Yeah, it requires. I, and I, I'm, I'm Bernie. I was not asking you to explain Woodbridge or, or Edison. I use that as an example because this just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I was going to switch to the charter school for a minute, but Laura, yeah. you want to? Yeah, because I actually just had a question since you're talking about funding. I know we can't talk about other districts. Um, well. But one of the things I wanted to point out, and you mentioned it, but I also would like you to kind of expound more, is the special education out-of-district tuition, the $1.2 million increase. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we learned during the process was the fact that those are unregulated or uncapped numbers. Mm -hmm. So when you mm -hmm. talked about, you know, we only had a few extra students, the 56, I think that's something that bears repeating because yes. that it doesn't matter how wealthy our town is it doesn't matter how all those numbers go up this is a number that we can't um we can't control it's so not regulated by the state well that's what i'm saying and so this they, and they don't take that into account with the funding when we're getting these cuts they don't take into account the fact that that goes up that's a right and and so um special education tuition rates for any um private school for the handicapped for example um the rate is the rate they calculate a rate that's the rate that's going to be paid by for any student from any school district. By they, you goes. don't mean the state. You no, no, mean no. the you mean <laughs> the school. The, the school district yep. will pay that rate regardless of what school district it is, right. as long as they're placing a student in that program at whatever private school for the handicap that happens to be. Um, one of the things that uh, we experienced this quite a bit this year with private schools for the handicap, and that is um, numerous notifications mid-year saying that um, our costs are increasing and I'm paraphrasing but yeah. our costs are increasing beyond what we anticipated so here's your notice that the tuition rates are going up now not next year they're going up now yeah. so we're going to charge you more now um, we had received several notices like that for private schools for the handicap. There's no planning for that. Mm -hmm. There is no magic pot of money <laughs> to be able to, to uh, fill in that kind of a gap. What it requires of us is to start to look at the entire budget and where can we not do some of the things that we had planned to do, where can we reallocate resources, to be able to cover those obligations because they are obligations. We have real students in those placements. 
Matt, maybe this is something you can answer um, going along with what Laurie said. So we talk about caps, we talk about uncapped, we talk about um, designated increases, but yet we, so much of our special ed budget um, hinges on a group of facilities that are not regulated by the state and can increase their tuition at any time to any amount, and any school district has to pay that. So there's no regulation and correlation to the amount of state aid you get or the amount of budget can be capped. So there's no correlation. And, and we have been for, I was trying to calculate how many years we've been talking about this, not only at East Brunswick, but among Middlesex County Superintendents Group. It's going on nine years in addressing this issue with legislators and bringing it up to a variety of governors to talk about this is an impact on school districts, mm -hmm. and no one seems to want to regulate it. It's been allowed to occur year after year, and even even now, recently, it, it's not. It doesn't have it doesn't have enough horsepower for anybody to do anything about it. I can tell you, Dr. Valeski, um, and I know you know this from your previous superintendent. It's been going on a lot more than nine years. I mean, this is one of the first things I heard when I got on the no, board. No, I know. What, yeah. but it, right, but I, I know why like, you've been here yeah. advocating, absolutely. You're one of the best advocates we have. Um, I'm just trying to, what I'm doing with a lot of these questions and what some of the other board members are, trying to make sense of a lot of these, these points and to take a, a bit of a deeper dive into the why before we come up with the how, so to speak. Um, Charter school. I remember when the charter school first came into being, we there were a lot of appeals. There were a lot of things going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we weren't successful with a lot of them. Um, are, can we still appeal? Is there still an appeal process for um, if Hatikva wants to keep adding sections and grades? They actually have. They've, they've been approved right. out to 2028. So when was the last, and the answer to this question could be, it would be a moot point, it won't do anything, it would cost too much money, that's okay. When was the last time we, we appealed them adding another grade? And um, is, it, is it worth it? Is it, is it worth, what, what is? It, it's not worth it. I mean, I can tell you, we, we had litigation Right when they first commenced operations in 2009. Right. Nine. I mean, recently. No, no, nine and 10. Uh, that went all the way through the court systems. Um, and basically what the appellate division ultimately said was, we grant the uh, commissioner um, deference based on their expertise, even though things weren't done. We challenged it again. Uh, one of the issues that we challenged a second time was that you're supposed to be a uh, charter school is supposed to serve the students within the district, mm -hmm. and so for example, lots of the charter schools are in Nork, Camden, Patterson, um, Jersey, Jersey City. City, where the children who reside in those cities go to those <laughs> charter schools. What you have, it's very unique here, is and then you can have charter schools of region. So, give you an example of the Sussex County Charter School the charter school that takes from adjoining towns in Sussex County. Had Tikva, and this was a challenge, and again, they said we give the uh, commissioner great deference, and this is when I think Brett Schindler was the commissioner. Um, so Had Tikva is basically a statewide charter school. They're taking kids from counties all over the state, and that was, and that's not in compliance with the law, but it, it but, but it we're, is. But we're only paying for East you Brunswick, only pay for East, East Brunswick, Brunswick, but other, other, so I would say that it would not be a, a wise uh, to appeal. It, okay. Yeah, it won't yeah. because the commissioner who grants the expansions is granted deference, and even when you and we've challenged it with the commissioner a number of times. I it, it was asked of me, and I felt it was worth asking. And one year we did challenge a, an expansion based on. Um, how they were doing, they were trying to expand a different grade. Yeah, and we slowed we it down. We prevailed, we slowed and then the down. next year they granted it. Yeah. Advice. So of the, 
of the current 640 seats at Hatikva, we have 313 students that are East Brunswick students. And by 2028, though, Hatikva has been approved to expand to 690 seats, grades K to 8. Something to look forward to. I bear with me one more question. And again, I'm, okay. I'm trying to touch on different areas that seem to go into um, the shortfall, the increase, the tax, the result. Trying to get a, a handle on, again, some of the why, more of the why. Uh, you talked about renewals, a six or seven percent increase for the transportation. Um, we know that there's been a shortage of buses for a long time. Um, I don't know if the public's aware that we have a we have to go out to bid for per diem routes. Um, what are some of the short-term or long-term plans that you have been discussing? Um, with the transportation staff and with Dr. Valeski to curb these transportation increases and the shortages because they're not going away. Right. So we've been talking at board level and in public meetings for a number of years regarding right. the lack of bus drivers and that certainly has a direct impact on what those costs are from the contracted services. Um, what are the things that we've done? When we expanded our fleet and first got into um, actually creating a robust fleet, uh, we were at roughly 40% uh, of the services were being provided in-house through our own bus fleet, 60% of the services through contracted services. That's now flipped. We're at about 60% of services being provided in-house, 40% contracted. Six. During this past year, we purchased, we're, actually they have, they, some have just arrived and some are about to arrive, but we expanded the fleet um, by taking back some contracted routes and using those funds to help pay for the buses and hiring staff. But we're maxed out at this point, pretty close to maxed out in terms of where we can house the buses. Our site, you know, you have to have a place to, to keep the buses. You need a central depot, which we have, mm -hmm. but we're now maxed out. So one of the things that we've discussed um, I don't recall if it was at board level. It may have been some conversation at one point. I believe we've had the conversation uh, at the facilities committee. But this is a longer term process. If we want to expand the fleet further and bring more of the services in house, we need to plan for an alternate site to be able to have our buses. So that's a bigger picture. It's a bigger discussion, figuring out a way to be able to do that. Um, we have a location in mind, but there, that's not something that would happen overnight. That would take several years. But we've done as much as we can do, I believe, at this point to try to um, maximize our efficiencies with transportation. Um, we have uh, constantly looked at how the services are being provided by the contracted services. We've taken routes back from contractors if they're not performing. We've negotiated with contractors to try to keep uh, the year-over-year -year increase to as close to zero as possible, which, by the way, we've been fortunate. We have a number of contractors. We had an update today with, uh, with the staff. A number of contractors that have already given a commitment to a 0% increase. That's good. But we have others and that yeah. have come in saying right. we want like seven, eight percent. Well, that's not going to happen because the state has already established what that CPI is. So we need to try and work out with those holdouts to bring them more in line to where we need them to be. Thank you. And I understand that. I 
But you also hit on something I think that's important and an important reason to have a discussion like this and questions like this. Some things are discussed in finance committee. Some things are discussed in the building and grounds facility meeting, the transportation committee, at the full board level. And we, we try and make sure that we're all kept up to speed out of all these committees. But sometimes things slip through the cracks. So it's, it's, it's good even if we've been told to be told again to ensure that everybody uh, understands. But also, some of these things are things that residents have questioned over the years, and they can still keep questioning it, asking the same questions every year, and they you know, deserve to be asked. So thank you for all your patience. I could keep going. I'm sure you really would well, want me to. I, I, but I, I'm to going to let the other board anyone? members <laughs> ask some questions. Mitch, I'm going to let I'm gonna let. Okay, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Go ahead, Mr. Hahn. So I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about the number. When our Governor Murphy very proudly announced this is our first time be fully funded by the formula. And then I watched his speech. I was very excited. And then when I, at the night, when I dig out further, I, I was kind of very upset. So the formula, they use kind of still the number when everyone sitting here knows exact how many students we have. But the trouble, the same trouble in me is that equalized valuation and the district income. If you do the math, you can tell that equalized value in East Bronx the last four years increased 24%. Who got this, made this decision? East Bronx the value increased 24% for the last four years. Let's talk about the district income. So this number even more troubling. So 2021, 2022 only actually decreased about 0.1%. But 2022 compared to 2021, it's jumped up 11%. And then 23 compared to 2022, it's about 0.4%. 2024, this year, it increased 14%. Who has this? See, for two reasons. Why this number fluctuates this big? And second, who made this, who got this number? You said this is from the uh, tax division, uh, treasury department. Could they simply make a mistake for this huge fluctuation? I can't So this is very that. bothering me, this number. So East Bronx, I don't, my personal experience, I don't think East Bronx is that Changed that dramatic, dramatically for the last four years. But the value increased 24%. The income for two years went up 11%, and then this year 14%, and the two other years was flat. So this is troubling me a lot. I don't know where we can verify this number, but this deeply impacts our state aid. We won't be able to verify the number. We have to trust the number. Well, the number, you know, the, the data, the Department of, of Education uh, receives the data from the Department of Treasury. Treasury is the keeper of the data when it comes to the equalized valuations and income. I, I just don't understand this. Why is this huge difference and huge uh, fluctuation and uh, again huge increase, which definitely caused the state aid reduction. So that, that, that is my concern. I know you, you're working very hard to try to make both ends meet, but the, when the income comes too little, I don't think you can do too much. That's, that's a, but I'm going to personally, I will try to dig out if the, so this year's income is 14% increase, especially the tax season has now come up yet. So I, I, it's bothered me a lot, such big decrease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giuliano. It's not easy. Your job. I appreciate it. To be it. continued. To be continued, yes. Um, so I have one more other question. But on a positive note, um, Chris is back. Welcome back, my friends. Um, we've missed you. 
We would love to know all the happenings at the high school. And also, dare I ask, decisions made yet? Uh, yeah, the uh, decision finalized. Um, I decided to commit to Princeton. For Yay! Next I love you staying in Jersey. It makes it much easier for you to come visit. It really does. Because you will always be able to come sit in that seat. So. Mm -hmm. All right, tell us what's going on with your classmates. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, after spring break, clubs and classes at East Brunswick High School have wasted no time getting back into the swing of things. However, before we get into that, prior to spring break, on March 21st, the East Brunswick Wind Ensemble and Concert Band performed at the Central Jersey Music Festival and received two gold ratings. This was an improvement from the last two year, from the last year, where both groups received a silver rating, and a testament to the dedication and hard work of the students in the band program and the fine arts department at the high school. In the month of April, Asian Club held its annual Asian night on April 5th, filled with lots of food, delicious, delicious food, lively performances, and live music from EP students. Then, on April 8th, staff and students at East Brunswick High School got to enjoy viewing the solar eclipse during the last period of school out on the football field, which was a great experience and just a nice time off from studying after a week off from school, you know? No senioritis for you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. And finally, for upcoming events, at East Brunswick High School, the Day of Silence will be held tomorrow for the entirety of the school day. The Senior Staff Variety Show by the Senior Class Council will be held on the 19th to raise money for prom, and the AP Ipple class will attend nationals for the We The People competition this weekend at DC, and we're actually going down tomorrow, so very exciting. Good job. Thank you, thank you. That's no, no pressure there, that's all. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Got to win every year. That's great. Yeah. I have to tell you, I know there's people that would be out there saying, wow, you're lucky you got into Princeton. I have to tell you, Princeton's lucky to have you. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You've, you've been a wonderful asset to this board. They're absolutely lucky to have you. So, Cher, w what field of study are you thinking about at Princeton right now? Uh, I'm thinking about going to economics just because I like math and I like studying the markets and stuff. Mm. Then when he comes back to East Brunswick, we're going to see the uh, income go up more, right? <laughs> Terrific. Look forward to it. I do. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Okay, bringing us to the good of the cause for the public. The Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. To protect the privacy of all students and staff, concerns regarding individual students and staff members should generally be addressed by first meeting with the appropriate administrative, administrative staff. In order to permit the fair and orderly expression of such comment, the board shall provide a period for public comment in every meeting of the board. A participant will be limited to three minutes duration. Elapsed time will be determined through the use of a timing device operated by the board secretary. And I always like to remind the public um, that this is your time to speak to the board. Please don't mistake our silence um, for not uh, caring about the issues. Anything that needs follow-up will be directed to the lovely ladies in the front. Is there anyone this evening that wishes to speak to the board? Okay, if you could speak your name and address for the record, please. Hi, Mark Sismar, 100 Fresh Bones Road. I don't have a lot to say tonight. I used to from that seat, um, just because I don't have details. So I do want to start out with uh, complimenting Mr. Juliana. I know what you've done over the years. I know how you roll over debt. I know how you balance the budget, save money, and all that kind of stuff. So this isn't a knock at you. It's not a knock at the Finance Committee, because I know you folks are volunteers like I was. But was the question asked, because it seems to me, and I don't have any details yet, it seems to me this budget was built based on anticipating a $6.5 million increase in state aid. To me, that's basing a budget on anticipated revenue that we weren't guaranteed. So I guess my question would be, and, and maybe somebody can ask it at that point, or maybe they've asked it already, but they didn't say it tonight. Did anybody say, why are we building a budget? with a six point, uh, expecting a gain of six point million dollars? And I know you're not gonna answer tonight, and, and that's fine. Um, you only have to say, I'm, Mr. Hung, I'm not an economist, but uh, I'll play one for a minute here, because I can. I, I, don't think, I don't think those state numbers show that everybody here made a 14% increase, because a lot of us, <laughs> none of us got a 14% increase. But when there's a rollover in a township, um, and that shows the value of, of this township and, and the district. If you have retired people moving out, 
that are collecting a pension for $10,000, and then you have a double income family coming in making $300,000, when all those numbers are bundled together, you, you, you can see a 14% increase in, in the total income of, of a township, especially this size with 50,000 residents. And that's just a guess, like I said, I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night so I can play expert for a minute. But uh, I think that's how that goes. We can't look apples to apples uh, on, the, on that type of a figure. So yeah, the question is, you know, like I said, that's my one question. Why did we build a budget anticipating $6.5 million from the state? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sismar. Is there anyone else this evening that would like to speak to the board? No? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Dr. Zimbicki, how can I forget? Good evening, everyone. Dana Zimbicki, president of the East Brunswick Education Association. I'm speaking tonight out of great concern for the members of the East Brunswick Education Association who will be impacted by this most recent budget crisis of an $8 million shortfall. I feel like it's a bit of a deja vu as I spoke similarly in 2020 when approximately 70 EBA positions were cut. At that time, there was not shared sacrifice with the other units. East Brunswick Principals and Supervisors Association and Central Administration. And my fear is that we might experience that again. If this is the case, it will be painfully obvious to my members and to the community that the cuts are not equitable and rest fully on the backs of EBA. Those staff members that have by far the more and most direct contact with students and parents in East Brunswick. I don't want to see anybody lose their jobs or have their jobs altered, but I do believe when the numbers are this large and this impactful, there should be shared sacrifice. It's actually heartbreaking to see this inequity of patching the holes in this budget if we do do this on the backs of the EBA unit. So I'm gonna end with this. I, as the president of the East Brunswick Education Association, cannot support a budget if there is not shared sacrifice among all units and central administration. It should not be on the backs of the EBA unit with this magnitude of $8 million. And I do not understand how any one of you could be comfortable with that decision should it occur. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zimbicki. Okay. Is there anyone else this evening? Okay. Now I'm going to just want to make sure I'm not missing anyone. I'm going to close the public portion and bring us to our Board of Education items this evening. May I please have a motion for items one and two? Moved by Mrs. Becker, second by Mrs. Herrick. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, motion carries. We've got two items this evening for curriculum and instruction. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Becker. Second. Second by Mrs. Gloss. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Aye. Oh, abstentions. Oh. In favor, yeah, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> abstentions, motion carries. We have one item this evening on facilities. Mrs. Becker and who's the uh, Mrs. Herrick? Is there any discussion? I had a quick comment on that. If yes, that's okay. please. I just uh, wanted to thank the team of people who are working on that. This is a huge contract uh, for managerial custodial services across the district, and um, a lot of work went into vetting organizations that applied for this. And, and as you know, uh, this is a huge component of what goes into keeping students, faculty, administration, everybody who comes into our building safe and healthy. So I just wanted to thank all the people who are a part of that process. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Anyone else? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries. We have six items this evening for financial services. Moved by Mrs. Becker. Second. Second by Mrs. Gloss. Is there any discussion on any of those items? You know that I'm going to ask the secretary to please call the roll. Mrs. Becker. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. Gloss. Yes. Mrs. Herrick. Yes. Mr. Hong. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. Mrs. Lax. Yes. Motion carries. A new one I see. Food services. 
so moved. moved by Ms. Second. Becker, second by Mrs. Guas. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstention? Motion carries. Bring us to human resources. Two items this evening. So moved. moved by Mrs. Second. Becker, second by Mrs. Guas. Is there any discussion? Will the secretary please call the roll? Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Cummings? Yes. Ms. Gloss? Yes. Mrs. Herrick? Yes. Mr. Hong? Yes. Mrs. Reese? Yes. And President Lass? Yes, motion carries. And we've got four items this evening on student <coughs> services. Building. Moved by Mrs. Becker and second. No discussion? We have to move it first. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Would you like to be my second? I would love to be the okay, second. Okay, second by I'm Mrs. So sorry. Buck, and I'm going to ask you then to start out the discussion. I just wanted to know if we could get more information on item three, this drive scan. It just looked really interesting. I've never heard of this before. Dr. Figueroa? Yes. Um, Ms. Amaturo, our um, uh, K-12 um, guidance supervisor, um, actually it's 6 to 12 guidance supervisor, um, she actually brought this to our attention. This is one where the um, students and their folks, their parents, there's no uh, cost to them at all. Strive Scan works directly with the colleges, and the student can register for any college they want to get their own information on. So it's there no cost to the district or to the students or their families. This is a fantastic program. Many uh, other districts use this and are very happy with it. Uh, and I'm very uh, happy to say, and I appreciate the board's uh, support on this. I think our students and our parents uh, are going to really enjoy this. Dr. Figueroa, the universities and the colleges actually pay for the, right. they, they participate work. in the job fair, or the college fairs. They pay the fee. Yes. They, so they can collect the data from the students. Absolutely. And okay. only the students, the students get to choose what colleges get their mm -hmm. information. And this includes trade schools, right? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. So, Chris, if you want to reapply for school, <laughs> we can help. Just stop by the college fair. In case you feel sad about being done with the process, yeah. just in case. That's really good. Okay. Uh, will the secretary please call the roll? Mrs. Becker. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. Gloss. Yes. Mrs. Herrick. Yes. Mr. Hong. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. President Lax. Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Giuliano is going to tell you that I forgot one. But I'm right. going to say that I separated out the We the People com conference. So I'm going to ask for a motion so that Chris so moved. and his coach. Can I have everyone? All of us. Are this you going to make me? Okay, we'll let you pick then. All right, then in terms of discussion, I wish you luck. This is something yeah. that started back in my day. I love that it's still something we not only do but win. So. So it's a really old competition. It's a really oh, old competition. Yeah. He wants you to know how we old I am. my water. Yes, it's a very old competition. Yes. Um, voice vote. This is a voice vote, so all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. I wish you luck on that. Um, we are now to committee reports, information items, and for the good of the cause for the public, the board. Excuse me. Mrs. Reese. I just wanted to uh, comment on the Princeton brass band that we uh, had in our uh, package today and to say thank you to the Hughes PTA for it. it oh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Hughes PTA for bringing funding for that um, so that they're paying for the bulk of these uh, this beautiful uh, presentation of instrumental music for the students. And we know how hard the PTAs work to bring in mm -hmm. these kind of programs. So just a thank you from all of us. Thank you, Mrs. Reese. Sure. I just want to give kind of a collective shout out to uh, all the athletes, all the seniors, all the you know faculty administration in, in this season right now as we're kind of you know heading into. Are we in spring officially? Yes. Are we? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Uh, so as we're in spring here, but. Um, uh, it's just a really, you know, it, it's just amazing all the all the amazing things that are going on across the district. Uh, Miss Herrick and I were were both sitting in the bleachers at the high school earlier this week, cheering on the Churchill track team as they competed against South Brunswick. And you, you know, there's there's hundreds of kids out here engaging with one another and competing in, in friendly and fun comp <coughs> excuse me competition together. And and you know, it seems like that doesn't take a lot of work, but it really does, right? It takes so much work and effort on the part of so many incredible people to pull that off. And so I just want to, you know, celebrate those guys and, and congratulate them and thank them for all of their effort. Um, and, and, you know, what a special season, Chris, just hearing you talk about this upcoming new chapter for you. And, uh, you know, I know everybody up here shares our, our common 
you know, goodwill for all the amazing things that you will do. And you're one of, of you know, several hundred, hundred individuals who are going to continue to go out and thrive and, and do great things in the world. So I'm really excited for you. Uh, and for all the seniors who are in this season of life, too. So thank you. Remember those sentiments, because we still have a few more meetings with him, so we're going to be saying. Uh -huh. So I want you to remember what you said, because it was beautiful. You're going to say it again. Fair enough. Yes. So you're not old like me, so you won't have the senior moment of not realizing he said it to you before, so you'll pretend. <laughs> Mrs. Goss. Um, just to piggyback on what Mr. Cummings said, and you'll have this opportunity, I am sure, when you get up to the high school, but also a huge shout out to the booster clubs because what they do for the kids is amazing, and, and you definitely, with all the pollen in the air, should come by the high school any weekend morning because there's always a car wash to support some team. Um, and there are always a bunch of children out there shivering early in the morning waiting to wash your car. Um, I wanted to comment, though, on the phenomenal job of the elementary schools um, for the children watching the eclipse. I had the opportunity to be at Memorial. Not that I was there in any official capacity. I was just there to pick up a six-year-old. But it was amazing. Um, the kids were spread out. They had their little towels. They had their glasses on. They had coloring pages they were working on to keep them busy while they were waiting for things to look at. It was the most orderly group of, and so many, I mean, Memorial's got a very large student population. It was the most orderly group of little children waiting for something. I mean, we've all had to wait with a small child, and it's no small task. And to just see how many hundred of them sitting, engaged, talking to their teachers, following directions, and just being so excited for this event, um, and I will stop there because my daughter also wanted to calculate how old we would next be at the next eclipse and the one after that. I'll be 106. Oh, she was so excited. <laughs> right, right, come on, you could say it. But I was, I was just watching yeah. as a parent, and then I looked at it for a moment as an educator, and I was like, look at all of them being attentive and safe and following directions. The teachers did a phenomenal job just keeping everybody safe and focused and it was just a great moment to watch. So That's thank you. Wonderful. Well, actually, so speaking of kids, um, I know that we're talking budget right now, but I would like to extend an invitation to the board members. You may not realize this, but our next board meeting also happens to be Take Your Child to Work Day. So since we are in the business of children, I know some of us have more than others, um, I would like to put it out there that any board members that would like to have their children join us that evening on the dais, I would love to have Seriously? it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can absolutely. we make it? Can we make it? Bring your favorite child to work. <laughs> so we can because my dog is coming. Madison, so, um, one hundred percent is asking. I mean, if you've got to sort them down, just take your favorite. Well, it's going to get crowded right here. <laughs> but we have some space. Yeah. Quinn can sit with me. Okay, and so Madison is asking. She wants to be a board of editor. That yes. is her feeling that that's what we do. We I just board of think, editors. I think it's a, it's a nice thing. So for any of you that are willing and able, um, I would love to have uh, the young ones. I miss the young ones. So um, just wanted to put that out there to all of you. And yes, we will certainly, I will find a way to provide seats. As I said, I will share mine. They are little people, yeah. some of them. So um, yeah. I'll give mine up for the night. Yeah. So is this a dog-friendly environment? Because seriously, since she said favorite child, I'm thinking that maybe. Oh my uh, goodness, Scooby's gonna come. Is this, uh, right? You can, he's not. He's not hypoallergenic. So is, um, is Scooby a therapy dog? He is a therapy dog. Yeah. <laughs> is in he'll be in therapy every time I leave him. He has separation anxiety. My children run willingly into the world. My dog is uh, desperate for my return. So um, just wanted to put that out there to everybody. Okay, Mrs. Herrick. Um, I know we talked about sports and it was great to see Mr. Cummings and a lot of parents out to support track the other day. As well as last night, I was at Churchill Junior High for the middle school softball team. Um, and there was a lot of parents there too. Um, so it's really great to see everybody out there supporting our sports teams. And uh, a few weeks ago, I went to Churchill for their drama club, um, the Adams Family, and I have to say, I was blown away. The kids are just amazing. Um, the singing, the dancing, the props that they used, everything. And you can just tell how much they loved it and how engaged they were, and they were so proud of the work that they put on. So kudos to the students as well as the faculty that supports them, because it was really nice to see such a great time. That's great. 
And we're going to have the ULI kids, maybe some more learning across the district. I love all my kids. And my favorite person I see sitting there. My first, I have to come visit your class. Anytime. Not that I play favorites, Anytime. but I play favorites. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, we do have a need for another closed session. So whereas the Board of Education must discuss matters which are not appropriate for discussion in a public meeting, these subjects are within the exceptions to the Open Public Meetings Act and are permitted to be discussed in closed session. The Board of Education intends to discuss matters as follows. Those items listed on tonight's agenda. The length of closed session is estimated to be one hour, after which the public meeting of the Board shall reconvene and action may be taken. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the East Brunswick Board of Education will recess into closed session for only the aforesaid subjects, and be it further resolved that the East Brunswick Board of Education hereby declares that its discussion of the aforesaid subjects will be made public at a time when the public's interest in disclosure is greater than any privacy or governmental interest being protected from disclosure in accordance with the Open so Public moved. Meetings Act. Mrs. Becker Second. and Mrs. Gloss, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you.